Welcome to the show. Very fortunate to have Joey Mullen of Badfinger on the show today. Uh, Joey has a new album out called uh, Be True to Yourself, recorded with some great people. So we'll get to that, and uh, plus we'll talk about the history of his band, Badfinger. Uh, they were a big power pop band in the 70s. Uh, the first band signed to the Beatles' Apple Records, actually. Uh, they had some big hits that I'm sure you all know, like uh, Come and Get It, which was produced by Paul McCartney, uh, No Matter What, Day After Day, and of course, Baby Blue, which everyone heard that played at the end of the Breaking Bad finale. Um, so we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about much more with Joey. Uh, you'll have to listen carefully to this one. Uh, don't put this on double speed or time and a half. Uh, it's sometimes a little bit hard to understand. Uh, possibly because of the phone connection or because of his accent, uh, but he's got some great stories nonetheless. So please enjoy this. Yo, welcome to the show, Joey Joey Mullen. How you doing? Well, I'm doing pretty good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, you know, first off, we just got to get. Uh, well, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Um, you know, this was a big tragedy two days ago. One of the greatest guitarists of all time, Eddie Van Halen, died. And I just, I had to get your guitar player. I know this is maybe not s certainly your era, um, but you must have some thoughts on the matter. Did you ever meet Eddie Van Halen or? Yeah, I did. no, I didn't meet him. Uh, I've never met, uh, certainly never met Eddie. I would have remembered. But uh, yeah, it is a tragedy. Yes, it's a disaster. Yeah, you're a lovely, lovely, lovely man. I, uh, everything I've heard and read about him has been nice, stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Um and what a what a great talent! It's always sad to lose a talent like that. So, yeah. So did he kind of changed he kind of changed a lot, didn't he? Changed music a lot. Yeah. Do you remember like when that like first Van Halen album came out? I mean, did it kind of? I would assume that as a guitar player, it kind of blew everybody away. Going, what is this? I mean, it was a totally different sound. Well, it was kind of me. My initial reaction was too many notes, too many notes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I I play such a different style from that right. from him. Yeah. Um, but uh, I could appreciate what he was doing and and, uh, and enjoy it in certain instances. Um, but there's no denying that the guy's influence is on the music world. You know, there's just there isn't any denying that. Right. Um, but he's really incredible, really incredible. And I, I, I was really sorry to hear about him. He's really yeah. young. You know. Uh, yeah, just a, just a disaster, really, for his band, for, his, for him, and for music in general, really. Yeah, really a great vibe, a great ambassador. Mm -hmm. um, just so many great things about him, you know, his uh, his defensiveness. Uh, you know, the the the, the stuff that I got about him doing building his guitars and uh, changing things inside them. I mean, doing all of that stuff as well. Mm -hmm. You know, not only playing the guitar the way he did. And then developing that incredible style. Uh, it's amazing, really. Yeah, no, definitely was. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's talk about you for a little. You're pretty amazing yourself here. So you, you grew up in England in the 1950s and 60s. Explain to me what that was like growing up in the 50s and 60s in England. Um, well, I had a working class upbringing. Um you know, my dad was a like a garage mechanic. He was a sergeant in the army, and then he was he worked in a garage uh, uh, doing that stuff for the rest of his life, servicing cars and stuff. Uh, I inherited a few of those talents. As it happened, mm -hmm. but, um, it was in the, I, I had a great family. Um, I had five brothers. Mum and dad were married forever. Uh, I was married myself wow. for many years as well. Uh, uh, after that, of course, but. It was a it was a very exciting place to play up. A lot of rock clubs, a lot of uh, bands playing, and for a musician that was great. Uh, a lot of people to go and see and, um, and learn from. Right, and you actually, uh, what's interesting to me is that so you were as a kid, you were just into normal kid things like playing football and bows and arrows and all this stuff, and then one day, just by chance, you happened to hear from some tiny radio station, you happened to hear Elvis Presley's blue suede shoes. And that's really what kind of changed your course of life. You grabbed your brother's guitar and you taught yourself to play. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, it really did change my life. Uh, you know, people say that all the time, but in this instance, I heard Elvis Presley. Man, I was a different kid, uh, after that, at the end of that record. 
And really was, I went, like you said, I went in and got my brother's guitar on and started to learn to play. And uh, that's all, really all I've done ever since. Is he, uh, so would he be your favorite know. guitar player or who, who's your favorite guitar player? Oh, I had a bunch of them at that time. I was listening to uh, Scotty Moore was Elvis's guitar player. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, Buddy Holly was another real, real strong influence. Uh, Chuck Berry, of course. Uh, and all the great American rock and rollers. Um, if you want to talk about guitar players, there's people like Steve Crocker. Um, now, don't you know, I can't remember anybody, can I? Because you asked me that. <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, yeah, yeah, a bunch. Uh, just a bunch of uh, musicians, a bunch of players. Um, I, I, through my life, I, uh, I got turned on to different guys. Uh, in 1968, uh, I really got uh, uh, really got turned on to B.B. King. Mm. Uh, took, took me for over, took me a while to realize I, I couldn't learn B.B. King uh, licks. Uh, well, his licks were so musical, and I was a near trained musician. Mm. Uh, I never, I never had lessons or anything like that, so it was very difficult for me to understand uh, what B.B. was playing. Yeah. Uh, so you started playing. Because they had such a pattern. Yeah, no, I was just, you know, to tell your story, you, you, you played guitar and then you actually got a job. You had to get a job on the docks. You didn't start out as a uh, professional musician. And uh, tell me if this is right. You played on street corners and it took you about two years to get involved in the scene in Liverpool. Uh, I mean, I just think, and this was at a young age, at two years at a teenager, early 20s. I mean, that seems like an eternity to me, did you ever think of giving up at that point and going, you know what, maybe this music thing isn't going to happen. I should just focus on the doc job and try to work my way up in that company or. Uh, no, because I was, I was, I was doing it. Um, uh, because I'd like, I just like to do it. Mm-hmm. I like to play. Uh, and I, the, the reason I went and played on street concerts was because I found a friend who liked to play. And then um, we'd just go there and sit on the corner and play. We weren't doing it to, like play to people or anything like that. Um, it was it was like you say it was a couple of years of doing it before we we actually went and played anywhere. You know what I mean? So right. I never wanted to do. I never got the idea. And also, I wasn't uh, imagining myself as being uh, you know some fantastic guitar player. I just enjoyed it so much. Yeah. Uh, and that's all it was. I didn't care whether I was playing lead or or fabulous lead guitar, I mean, you know, uh, riffs and that all the time. I was just playing plain old rhythm, you know. Um, I learned to play rhythm very well, and it, it got me some good jobs, actually, later on in my life. Um, it was because I had a good sense of rhythm. I could keep tempo. Uh, I knew the Chuck Berry accents. I knew uh, the way different, you know, different people played rhythm. I watched it, and, and I studied that, you know, mm-hmm. um, so I got known for it, really. I got known for being a, a, a rhythm guitar player. and But I've got a musical ear as well. I can think of, um, you know, guitar riffs like, like I, when we when I was in Badfinger later on, mm-hmm. and we were recording Baby Blue, and he needed a, a, a guitar solo in it, or we needed a guitar solo. I was able to come up with something that was a little bit original and work with the chords of the tune. Um, and I've learned all that from Buddy Holly, you know, because hmm. uh, that's that's the way he plays guitar solos is is from the chords of the, of the uh, songs he's written, you know. Right. Yeah. So you would, you know, you joined the Profiles. You were in a band called the Masterminds. You started to get involved in the scene, and then, um, kind of on the off to the side here, Badfinger started out. They started out as the Ivies, and so the story goes that uh, it was actually their manager played with Paul McCartney's father and he found out that they were starting a record label. So this guy, Bill Collins, just, he talked his way into the Beatles studio and hustled his way into getting a deal with the, the Beatles Apple record, which, um, interesting. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So interesting side note on that. Yeah. yeah, Interesting side note on that too, is the Apple, uh, record label. I don't know. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Apple iPhones, Steve jobs was a big Beatles fan. And and I think they ended up suing him for that name. Right. (laughs) Uh, that's what they did was they did a, uh, some kind of licensing deal. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The Beatles got paid. They got paid like some kind of royalty or some kind right. of uh, fee for, 
the uh, yeah. Apple being able to use it. Yeah. 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 So before you joined the band, um, it was, again, it was called the Ivies. They did the song come and get it. And McCartney produced it and he told, he gave it to the song, uh, the band bad finger, but he told him, okay, it's gotta be exactly like this demo. And the band was like, okay, we'll do that. <laughs> and so, I mean, when Paul McCartney tells you to do something, you do it. And so they recorded it. Did you, did you hear that song on the radio before you had, you knew, must've knew of that song before you joined bad finger, right? No, 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 no. Uh, you've got the story right, but you're a little bit ahead of yourself. The, mm. uh, I joined the band uh, while they were called the Ivies. They mm. recorded, they recorded coming down. It. That whole story you just told yeah. that, that uh, had happened. They recorded the song, and then the bass player left the band. Right. Uh, so the bass player of the Ivies left. Tommy was the guitar player, Tommy Evans. He decided he was going to play bass, so the band started looking for a uh, guitar player. And somebody recommended me for the job, and I went and auditioned, and I got the job. They gave me the job. And uh, so that was that. I was in Badfinger, and the, well, then they changed the name to Badfinger. Then the record came out under that name. Oh. Yeah, so let's. So I was in the band when yeah. the record was a hit. Okay, but I okay. wasn't on the record. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and that's interesting. So they changed the name to Badfinger because there was already a band uh, named Ivy League, and Badfinger. You guys that's thought it right. sounded more rock and roll. Is actually uh, from the Beatles when they did a uh, with a little help from my friends. This that song was originally called Badfinger Boogie because John Lennon played the piano on a demo, and I guess he screwed up a lot, and so you guys took that name from that, right? Isn't that where it came from? Yeah, that's what happened, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and so were the Beatles, because I, I heard that John wanted to call you guys the Pricks, P-R-I-X. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So was he... That was, one of the, uh, that was one of the ideas came up, you know. And Paul wanted to call you guys Mother's Little Helpers. Yes. So yes, th they true. So they, both John and Paul were kind of involved in helping name the band? Well, yeah, because the band was signed to Apple. Yeah. Uh, the band wanted to change their name. So, you know this, when any band wants to change their name, everybody around them comes up with a name for them, you know. So, wow. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. They were, they were trying to think of names. Uh, and Paul's was Polish, and, uh, and John's was Johnny-ish, you know what I mean? So, so did you have a lot of, inter were they pretty hands-on with the band at that point in, the, in your guys' career? In the early days, somewhat, somewhat, but not really, not really hands-on, not, not everyday thing. Um, the, the reasons uh, why Paul took the song over there, there are but there are reasons for that. So, uh, you've already pretty much told the story. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, yeah, yeah, they weren't really hands-on. Later on, um, after the band had the initial success of Come and Get It, and then No Matter What, uh, which was produced by Mal Evans, one of the Beatle roadies. Yeah. Uh, and, and Jeff Emmerich was the engineer. Right. But, uh, after we'd had the success with those things, we went in the studio ourselves. And uh, this was after our first American tour. And uh, Tommy and Peter, our guitar player and um, bass player, they wanted to be producers. So... They wanted to produce the next album, so we did the yeah. album. They mixed it and produced it, and then they delivered it to Apple. We delivered it to Apple. But uh, the Apple offices in New York, uh, they didn't like it. Hmm. So we had to uh, go in there and go back in the studio and re-record a new album hmm. for them because they thought it sounded too crude, and they wanted something more sophisticated. And what happened was that... When Apple in London heard that, they uh, they talked about it among themselves. And I'm talking about the Beatles and that here, what they were going to do about the band. And uh, George uh, volunteered to produce us, George Harrison. Right. And so we that's when we really started working uh, close with them. You know, uh, John was, I mean, George was there every day with us in the studio working. Of producing a record for us, wow. and uh, it was great fun. I got to tell you, we had to be taught us a lot. Uh, we recorded the we recorded the album, um, 
excuse me, put about a halfway through it, and the uh, Bangladesh tra- tragedy happened. Um, and then George was asked if he would, if he could do anything to help help the people over there, and uh, he, he he decided that he'd have to stop doing the bad thing around them. Right, and he would go and try and do that, do something because they needed help immediately. Mm-hmm. And uh, he went up to New York. He recommended to us this guy Todd Runquin, right, who volunteered to come in and finish the record with us. Todd was the American star, and he was um, a friend of George's. Mm-hmm. So he came over and finished the album up with us, and did the mixing and final production on it. Did a great job of it. Was our best selling album. Mm-hmm. Um, had a couple of hits on it. Baby Blue and Day After Day were both enormous hits. Um, Day After Day featured George, George Harrison playing slide guitar along with Pete uh, on on the track, and uh, yeah. it was a really a big hit for us and a lovely experience. No, yeah, but so let's back up that first album, No Dice, which again includes that monster hit, uh, No Matter What. Um, that's like one of the first yeah. songs you recorded with him. Um, and like you said, you produ- it was produced by Mail Evans and uh, Jeff Emmerich. Now, so uh, the Beatles producer George Martin, he called. He said about Jeff Emmerich that uh, he credited him with bringing a new kind of mind to the recordings, always suggesting sonic ideas, different kinds of reverb, and what we could do with the voices. So, what did he bring to your album as a producer? Because it sounds like he helped the Beatles it's a lot. The same stuff. He, he, he brought his ears. Uh... We never, we never thought of him as the producer. We always, Jeff was the engineer. Okay. Uh, uh, and we always thought of Mal as the uh, producer. But I'm sure that when Mal and Jeff were working on the on the, the recording, uh, uh, Jeff had a lot to do with what we sounded like, and uh, and a lot to do with, uh, you know, how the guitars were used and how the vocals were uh, affected, how they were recorded. Um, I'm not the only thing I can tell you about. I never really did talk to Jeff about it. Although we did several records working with him, you know, um, over, uh, over Abbey Road. Mm-hmm. Um, but we always thought of Mal as the producer. And we, he recorded us, I'm sure, from all this experience with the Beatles, uh, of watching them uh, work in the studio. He allowed us to work the same way to develop the songs, develop the parts, develop the harmonies, um, and just made sure we were recorded, and then and then it was balanced right, hmm. you know, uh, yeah. mixed right. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, he was more, Mal was a bit more talented, I think, than a lot of people give him credit for. Uh, you know, they tend to look at him as a big, you know, big, big guy who, Really didn't know what he was doing, and but, but he really did, as is evident by no matter what being one of the most popular songs ever, you know, right, one no. of the most popular records ever. And it's still on the radio today. Oh yeah, <laughs> so, it's great. And then yeah, yeah. you also around this time you played on um, before George Harrison produced your album. He, you actually played on his "All Things Must ha- uh, Pass" solo album, which also had Eric, Eric Clapton, Peter Frampton, Phil Collins. Billy Preston, Ginger Baker. Did you have inter- any interactions with those guys, or re- did you record separately? No, we recorded. Uh, the, when, well, it's easier to say this. When, when that thing that was doing the George record, we were in, in the studio there. There was George. There was Eric Clapton, uh, Klaus Foreman playing bass, Billy Preston playing uh, keyboards, and Ringo Starr playing drums. Um, that was the, the crew that was there when we did the back tracks and we, you know, we recorded those songs with it. Yeah. Um, all the other guys, Peter Frampton, uh, Phil, Phil Collins, uh, and those lads, uh, did their stuff as well with those afterwards. So we ran in on okay. those lads. Yeah. And then you also played on, yeah. uh, you played on John, Lennon, John Lennon's Imagine, but you said the tracks were not used. Um, but I'm just curious, like, you must have went in there and recorded with John Lennon. Now, I know you've worked with tons of great musicians over the years, but what about recording or, if, I don't know if you saw any of the songwriting process or just any sort of behind-the-scenes stuff can you tell me about working with John Lennon that makes him, like, the, one of the uh, best? John, John, was, John was very, 
And this, this was about something about all the Beatles, whether they were around them or working with them or whatever. They were always the same guy. Mm-hmm. They, they were, it wasn't like a, a rock star John Lennon and, and a regular guy John Lennon. He was just a regular guy who had that incredible talent, you know, the songwriting talent, the singing, uh, but his demeanor and his, and his way of, of, of being with you. Well, he was just a regular block, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he was really nice. Uh, he was aggressive when he spoke. He, 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 he spoke like a docker, if, if you get my meaning. Hmm. Uh, you know, he, but he was very social and very normal. So you did know it, what I mean? Uh, did it, I, it, it wasn't all, I think yeah. this and I think that and I think this. It wasn't like that. It was, oh, yeah, oh, yeah thanks for coming. And when, he, when they called us to do the sessions, um, they asked us, you know, John, he was like doing, doing him a favor, you know, coming coming down there to his house and playing guitar with him. It was like doing him a favor. It was, like you were doing him like, a favor. He, yeah, we were huh. doing him a favor. You know wow. I mean? So, but he is well, he like, yeah, th- does he is he have a really strong work ethic, or is it just come so easy to him? Like, what made him the? What do you think made him the, one of the greatest of all time? Was it just his natural talent? I think so, yeah. I think so. I mean, his upbringing was a little bit stiff. He yeah. went to good school. Um, and he made good friends with people. And, you know, people all his life uh, said he was like that. Yeah. And he was. just a normal, regular, everyday guy. Uh, he, he was affected by, you know, his parents, what went on with those, with, with, with those people. Um, but he was, as far as I know now, I can't tell you much about him because only, I was only living for one day. Yeah. You know? Okay. But he, but he was really nice. He was only really sober. Yeah. You know? Huh. But yeah, so then, uh, like you said, the Straight Up album, 1971, that had two producers. Um, Todd Rundgren ended up finishing it, but you started with George Harrison. And it, no, it was interesting. So, you, like you said, he played the slide guitar on Day After Day, but it's kind of like a similar thing with uh, John Lennon. He was so polite. Like, he didn't. He asked if it was okay if he could play guitar because he didn't want to intrude because it was your band after all, and he didn't want to like intrude on playing on the on the song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, he'd been in the band all his life. You know, he's only been in one band. But, yeah, uh, yeah. He, he was he was a regular guy to these. You know, the Beatles. They're not. They weren't rock stars. They just weren't rock stars. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't think they enjoy being around rock stars. You very rarely see them uh, yeah. hanging around, partying with rock stars. You know, although they, of course, they knew the Rolling Stones. They were really a bunch of regular guys as well. Mm-hmm. You know, you, when you hear Mick Jagger talking, he's just talking. You know, uh, Keith Richards is just talking. You know, right? Uh, it, 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 it's great. It, it, they do. They do think about their own talent and do. Appreciate them with talent. Yeah. Uh, and often, indeed, uh, think their band is the best. Right. You know? Yeah. But, but it doesn't make them change anything. What's the, what's the point of being in the best band in the world if you're a rock star? You know what I mean? Yeah. It, you know, it's only from a regular person's point of view that this is the best band in the world. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. No, oh, yeah, so it's a, it's just, uh, they, they, they were just like that, you know. That, yeah. It encouraged me a great deal. Uh, you know, I, I don't walk around shouting about what I do and everything. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I keep, I keep quiet about it if I'm going out. I don't go, I'm, I'm the guy from this part. You know, <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's just not part of the way. It's just not a way to live or a way to be for me. And, and it certainly wasn't for those guys. Right. And that's what George would come over and sit with us. And, you know, how are you doing? What's going on? You know, my shoes or whatever, you know. And uh, have you seen this new guitar I got? You know, you know, they were like regular right, these ones. And then he would sit down with you know, in the recording situation and we'd play the songs to each other. If we were doing his uh, record, he'd come and play the songs to us. And, he, you know, we'd, we'd grab the chords. Really, really, pretty quickly. Um, this is another thing there. We, we had the same upbringing as, upbringing as the Beatles. We 
know, we do Liverpool Reese's Tommy the bass player and I do Tommy Evans and me. And um, we can look at Liverpool, we played the same clubs, we went to the same music stores, listened to the same radio, uh, all of it, all hmm. of it was the same. Yeah. You know, we went to different schools, a bunch of schools in Liverpool, but we had the exact same upbringing. And huh. when we got into music, we all learned the same music. We all learned the Chuck Berry. We all learned the carpet. Uh, you know, all of that stuff. Right. We were all American, most of them. We had a few English hero musicians, but not that many. The majority of our influences were American. Um, so when we, when we sat down with George, because we had that same opportunity, we, could, we understood the form of the songs. You know, the intro, the verse, the chorus, the verse, the chorus, the yeah. bridge, the solo, how that went down. So it was just a question for us, was learning the song to get to a close of that particular song. And uh, so I can sit with us and teach it to us. It was great. Yeah. So that album, um, again, it had those two monster hits, Day After Day and Baby Blue. Todd Rundgren had helped finish it. Um, now, you said that he was kind of arrogant and kind of rude to you. This is kind of a funny story I heard. You say that... Well, um, he was... He, 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 it's kind of what? Yeah, well, so he... he I'm you, sorry, I, I'm sorry to interrupt No, 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 I just... I heard you tell the story that uh, you felt like he was arrogant and kind of rude to you as a producer. He didn't think you guys could play. It was a little awkward and tense, but of course, you know, the results are amazing. It's a great sounding record, but it was years later that you ran into Todd Rundgren in Atlantic City, and I thought this was cool. You came up to him and, and you called him out on it. You said, hey, why were you so damn rude to us? And his response was, I wasn't rude. You just remember it that way. And you just, and you thought you laughed because you thought that was a good comeback. I thought it was. <laughs> I was <laughs> I was flabbergasted when he said that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but isn't that even? Me that way. But isn't it even more but, insulting uh, that he wouldn't acknowledge the way he treated you? No, no, no. It was just Todd. It was just Todd Rundgren. Uh, he's still like that to this day. Uh, <laughs> I did a tour with him last. Yeah. I did a tour with him last year. We did forty shows uh, last year together. Yeah. And every one of them we go up with me and sang uh, "Baby Blue." Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and and uh, he's, a complete, he's a very professional diner. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but but uh, he brought this arrogance with him. Uh, at least I took it as arrogant. Yeah. Uh, he was. He, he seemed really conceited. Uh, he wasn't very respectful to us. Uh, even though we weren't using other musicians, uh, we, we were recording our songs uh all together as a band. You know, Baby Blue is pretty much a live record. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Hmm. Uh, wow. We did overdub an acoustic and mm. we did overdub the guitar solo. You know? Wow. Uh, and normal recording procedures were done and uh, he was just arrogant and that was kind of rude to us together. I don't think he thought we were very good. Um, you know, when he did all our demos and he did the record that Tommy and Peter so uh, he had his opinion. It wasn't to me making excuses for him. Mm. But in answer to your question, was yes, he was, <laughs> he was arrogant. And it, wasn't a, it was not a very pleasant experience. Not like working with Joe, which is kind of interesting if you think about it, because if you think of the two people, I mean, they're both very, obviously very talented people, but you'd think if anyone had a bigger ego or was could be ruder, it would be George. But George, you're saying George was the nicer of the two. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, 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 it is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, we, we work, well, we ended up working with a lot of this, Chris Thomas and, you know, people like that. Uh, and most of them were very, very nice guys. And most of the musicians that I've met in my life, and I've met really big, uh, Eric Clapton, he's a very nice guy. You know? Yeah. He's very normal. And he's very normal. They drive themselves around. They don't have roadies and crews with them, wherever they go, you know? Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the entourage didn't exist, you know? Right. They, 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 they just lived their life as normal, as normal people. And because they were musicians, they were very cool. They lived a very cool life. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's good. They, 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 they hung out with each other, you know what I'm saying? 
so that song baby blue um I know you didn't write it. That was written by Peter, but um, do you know, like, what is that about exactly? What What is the song? It, well, the song Baby Blue is, yeah, I do know about that particular song. He was uh, he was uh, in love with a girl, a uh, Dixie, uh, from uh, Tucson, Arizona, actually. I think oh, it's very natural. Very close uh, to Ryan. On tour. Yeah. And, uh, oh, okay, good, good. Uh, he met Dixie, and uh, she came on the tour with us, and then uh, he brought him over to England. Uh, but she left uh, after a short while. The he was working every day doing the band, and they weren't spending that much time together, and that wasn't good enough. Uh, that wasn't enough for Dixie. Uh, so she ended up coming back to America. Mm. And uh, he wrote that song about it because he mm. was in love with her. And uh, you know, he wanted it to stay, but it just it just wouldn't happen. You know, it didn't happen. So. Oh, okay, yeah, because it's it's an interesting that first line. He's like, "I guess I got what I deserve." I was like, "Oh, that's kind of it's kind of an interesting uh, line." I wonder what that was about. So that's interesting. Um, and then, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Nineteen seventy three, you guys did. Pardon? In 1973, you guys did the Ass album. I was just curious, was it hard to get that title out there in the 70s? Like, was there any pushback or fight from the record company? Like, were they worried about, like, censorship or? No, no, uh, uh, they weren't. They weren't worried about it. They, they were worried about other things. Uh, you know, like lyrics and songs. They didn't want you singing about drugs in songs and stuff, uh, <laughs> You know, or, or swear words all over the place. You know, well, that's going on. Uh, so, uh, not that we did a lot of that, but they were the things they were concerned about. Calling an album ass was, was, not, was a picture of a donkey. Yeah. Uh, on the corner. And that, you know, that's what we felt like uh, at that time. You know, so. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So things were starting to get <laughs> rough. Now, your manager, uh, Stan Poley, at the time, um, you you said he was kind of like a father figure to you guys, but apparently, uh, 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 I guess people didn't know he had been like a convicted felon, and he set up this corporation and it, it took care of all the money, but it basically cleaned you guys out, right? And that kind of part part of the reason that maybe led to the band. Oh yeah, he, uh, he cleaned it. Yeah, yeah, he did. Uh, yeah, his actions led to the end of the band. Um, uh, the, the band started the fracture because the same people liked him. And, uh, certain people didn't uh, in the band. Um, and then it turned out to be three to one. Three of us wanted to get rid of him and one wants to keep him. And, uh, you know, it, was, it just would get to be very disagreements going on in the band. Uh, uh, arguing about it. And it, it was a disaster. It was, it was a nightmare, you know. We had a great record deal. We could have gone on. Really, I think we would have gone on for years if we wouldn't have signed the bad guy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just sad. And then. So, uh, so, go ahead, go ahead. Let's no, go. I was just saying, you know, it's just sad what happened in 75. Um, you know, the band breaks up. And, and so Pete basically thinks everything's over. He thought he got screwed over by Paul, uh, Paulie. So he hung himself as a way to kind of try to stick it to, to somebody else or try to help his, like, bring attention to this act or something. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. Like, did you have any warning signs at the time or red flags with Pete that, that, that he was going to do that? I mean, it seems like it come, came out of the blue. Not, not really. Uh, you know, I found out later that he, that he you know, suffered a little bit with depression oh. uh, through his life. But um, I don't know. I never experienced that myself. Of course, and I lived with him. We all lived together in a little house in London. Uh, so I lived, there. and he was he was real social in those days. He was uh, a, a bit of a, a practical joker, hmm. you know. He would do things like uh, pretend to fall down the stairs, and have, he'd have blood capsules in his mouth and things like that. He'd be bleeding <laughs> on the floor, and, you know, just kind of rough. he'd do this for fun, you know, to yeah. entertain himself, and. Uh, so, you know, he, I, I wouldn't say he was a man of confession or anything like that. I'm sure after, uh, you know, you've done all that where he written all those beautiful songs. And he, he should have been a millionaire. You know, he really should have. He didn't spend a lot of money. He drove a second-hand car, uh, a used car, that I mean. And, uh, you know, he was, he, again, we, we took very little money out of the bank. 
real only took a little bit of me as a nuclear rate. We were trying to save a bit of money, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that was the idea behind it. We kind of do it as a, a, as a good business. We pay the only gigs, and we made a lot of money. Made a lot of money from the song, right? We got all our own songs. Uh, so we all made a lot of money. And uh, all the money was gone. All the money was paid to the corporation. I mean, here's the only spend it. Hmm. Put it down, put it down in, on, to his expenses, and uh, you know his expenses would include like flying movie directors in from uh, Hollywood to, to, to talk about movies, make a movie, of course that meant pulling them up at the Plaza Hotel and getting them escorts and taking them to fabulous places and hmm. doing all that. At the same time, he was shipping his own Rolls Royce wherever he went. Uh, Rolls Royce automobile, like, and uh, you know, he had a lot of getting an apartment in the uh, Beverly Hill and did that. And uh, he just, he just kind of spent the money really nearly. Was that, uh, and that was and all then, legal? It was all then, legal for that him to do that? It's still legal. It's, it's still legal for any manager to do that. If you look in their contracts, it says the bank pays all the expenses. Wow. Hmm. You know, that's, that's what the music business is like, really. Yeah. You know, even today, the bank pays for everything. Huh. You know? Yeah. And that's the fact of it. It's, it's, not, it's not a... You know, it's not the business that pays for the bank. It's the bank that pays for the business. You know, the, the business does not support the bands or the musicians or the writers. You know? That's right. not real work at all. The, the, the workers, it's, it's like, well, the workers support the business. Mm-hmm. That's what happens. Right. Interesting. That's how it is. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so then and this was 75 when Pete uh, hung himself. And then eight years later, then Tom Evans does the same thing. I mean, you must have just been flabbergasted to hear about this. Like, really, another member of my band is killing themselves? And again, it was about royalties or something like that. I mean, were, was there red flags for Tom's death as well? well? You no, know, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why uh, Tom did it. I, I really don't know. I've got ideas, mm-hmm. but they're, they're, they're only my ideas. They're not why Tom's died, mm-hmm. you know? And they're not, it's not why Peter died. What we're talking about here is because we're looking at that from the outside. We don't know what it was like being Pete Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't know that. I don't even know what I saw of him and what he showed me. You know, and he didn't, he didn't show me that he was the kind of guy who would go out and hang himself. You know, we, we, we thought for a while after it was done you know, that the manager had something to do with it. You know? Did they, were they into drugs and stuff? Was that a big thing? I mean, they drank uh, whiskey, and sometimes they drank too much, but they didn't mm. get up the next day and drink whiskey, and get up the next day and drink whiskey. They didn't do that. Mm. Uh, none of us really did heavy drugs. None of us. Okay. Uh, mm. You know, we did, we did smoke a little pot. Uh, you know, we did like a drink, you know, but we weren't, we weren't mad bruises or anything like that. You know, we uh, we would be happy where if we were, I don't believe so. Yeah. We just went like that. No, no, we went. We were really pretty lightweight. Huh. Uh, as far as most things go. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. two years later in 85, you, you guys went to court and you were able to divide up some of the money from the Badfinger royalties. And you were, and you moved to America and bought a house. Well, this, uh, yeah. Yeah. This, uh, this thing about the money, the royalties, when, we found out in 1974 that Polly was stealing all the money. We went to Apple Records, Neil Aspen in particular. He was the head of Apple Records at the time. And we asked them not to pay any more money, any more royalties out to the, uh, to the managers, not to send them any more money, because everything he sent was gone. Uh, and that's where all the money went. So Neil did that. He stopped paying the bad thing the royalties out. And he opened an escrow account and started putting the money in it. And eventually it got to be a lot of money. Mm. He, he took that account then to the courts of London. And he had a thing called an interpleader, uh, done. And this is where the, 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 the royalties 
started to be paid to the court oh, in London. Okay. And they, they, they controlled the money. And nobody could get any money out of that account until all four members of the Bad Finger Bank and our fifth uh, member, if you like, our fifth partner, and our personal manager, who was also uh, getting, getting his percentage, um, unless we all agreed, all five of us, on what the deal was, how the money was paid out, uh, we couldn't have any of the money. Nobody would get any money. So in 1986, from 1975 to 1985, for us to sort that out. Wow. Um, there were some questions about uh, royalties that were paid direct. We sorted that out. We went to court in London, signed the deal between us. Uh, that's the deal. Um, but since then, we all get all our money. And also the deceased yeah. people's... Uh... Tom and uh, Pete's families get their share, right? Absolutely, yeah. They yeah. get 100% of it. That's great. Yeah. Uh, sad that they're yeah. not around. And now so. their, children, their, their children get it, too. Yeah, now. yeah that's great. Of course. That's yeah. good. Yeah. But so, that's, that's the way it works out. Yeah. So if you, the you guys would have hung out, they would have ended Oh. Yeah, it's like a lesson, you know, yes. if people can persevere through those tough times, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, because you, you guys have a legacy that goes on. We're going to talk about that. I mean, did you do some shows with Ringo back in the day, Ringo Starr? You, you have any, you've, you've talked about George no, and, no, and no, Paul. No, 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 we, uh, we, we, we only played with Ringo at the Bangladesh concert. The Bangladesh, yeah. Uh, with George, which was the George show. And uh, but I've never played with any of the other guys, not with Paul or, 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 or John or anybody. Do you, uh, except on the record. Do you, do you yeah. keep in touch with Paul or Ringo at all? Or no, no, no. Okay. So then, in two thousand four, you uh, you re recorded about ten Bad Finger songs, and and that's helped you guys as well with the royalties and stuff, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 And then the song, let's talk about the song Baby Blue. So again, we talked about that already, but now it's making a comeback. It was in that movie, The Departed, which was a huge, huge movie. And then um, 2013, I mean, that was a big thing. The Breaking Bad finale, definitely the biggest TV event of the year, if not the decade. And they played your song, Baby Blue, at the end. It went back to the charts. It was like number one for like a week or something like that. And you said you had no idea they were going to do that. So how do they, like, how did you find out? Did you just... Was you? I think you said your son was a fan. Was he watching, or was someone else watching to call you and say, "Hey, you know they're using was, your song"? Well, I was, I was recording the episode for my son. Yeah, he was working. <laughs> and yeah, and I didn't know anything about it. And the reason for that is uh, when when a person dies, uh, his copyrights, at least in the music publishing world, his copyrights revert back to him or to his family. It's just a, a national law in England. And so Pete's family got all of Pete's sons back. And, and, and they have an, a, a, an administrator that looks oh, after that stuff for them. Okay. And it was him who made the deal. Oh, okay. Uh, but it's to be used. But they have no responsibility to tell me. Yeah. Um, they okay. only have responsibilities to make sure that I get paid. Sure. You know? Uh, and we get paid for performance. Publishing royalties and you know all of that stuff. Right. So that, but that, um, that having that song in the Breaking Bad finale that helped bo boost your concert attendance, right? Oh yeah, yeah. The concert started to sell out. Wow. Uh, but the audience, the audience was, was very more, very much uh, more mixed up, and, and a lot more young people were coming to see the band. That's uh, really cool. And I, you know, I hope they enjoyed the show. They, they reacted like they did. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was great. <laughs> it was and then, great. did you write a book about your bad finger years called uh, "When I Was a Boy"? But when I was a boy, that's your whole life story, right? Um, I thought it was called "When I Was a Boy." I did a uh, what I did was I did an interview. <laughs> oh, you did an interview. Uh, a long, yeah, uh, I did a long, long, long interview. Uh, 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 I told my entire story from when I was a kid all through my life and all the bad finger experience and everything. And uh, that the 
the guy who interviewed me, uh, Mike Camino, uh, he was going to make a book out of the interview, oh. but um, he was like a ghostwriter, if, if you like. Okay. And uh, uh, but then the the uh, the Hammer State guy, Matavina, Dan Matavina, he wrote a book about the band, and uh, uh, Mike Chimino was was a little bit worried about being sued uh, by uh, things that we said in the book. Okay. And so he decided to just publish the interview. Hmm. Uh, and of course, you know, they weren't about to sue me because I just I just told my story in the book. Gotcha. You know? Okay. Uh, and I, you know, I, I've had a good life. I don't need to lie about anybody or say anything bad about anybody, actually. Um, I thought about all the kids involved, you know, but the rest of their parents. I, I thought about all of that, you know, yeah. uh, when I was doing that story. So that's as close as I've got to doing a book. Gotcha. Uh, well, I do think I will. I, I, I think I may write a book. Yeah. Um, only because of a lot of things that I didn't talk about in in that interview, oh. and there are a lot there are a lot of stories which are kind of amusing and uh, entertaining if you like. I think people might would like to hear them. You know, they're not they're like they're not like mad things like uh, they're not like there's no orgy stories, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, which you know that's what everybody wants, you know. Right. Uh, and there and there are no. Uh, you know, insulting pictures or things like that. You know, but but uh, I still think there are stories there that are fun and uh, maybe people would like to read. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy, <laughs> you know, just the story of the band. I mean, it sounds like a movie or TV movie or something. Yeah, I mean, it's a, definitely a book for sure. Um, but tell me about your new record coming out. I've listened to some of it. It's produced by Mark Hudson, and he, that guy's worked with Aerosmith, uh, Ozzy Osbourne, Ringo Starr, Cher. I mean, he's he's pretty pretty big name there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to meet Mark uh, several years ago, uh, maybe 10 years ago or so. So, maybe, yeah, I got I got to uh, meet Mark at Beatles Fest and things like that. Hmm. Uh, and he always sang with me, always sang no matter what, what he always wanted to sing the high harmony. He's an incredible singer, you know. Yeah. Mark Hudson, he's a, he's a fabulous singer. Uh, he could sing anything. Uh, he's a brilliant record producer, obviously. And so I naturally wanted him to produce a record for me. We, we were kind of friends, and uh, you know, so I kept on hitting, not hitting on him to, to produce my record. And after about I don't know eight years or so of knowing him, he, he asked me one day, "Would I like to make a record?" <laughs> you know, so, uh, so we decided to do it together. Together it took about two years. Uh, raised a bit of money, ran out of money in the middle of it, got the, the Kickstarter fund together, and, and that put us over the top so we could, we could actually make the record. Uh, it turned out really good. We did a fantastic job. Uh, contributed to the songs. Uh, guest was just was fabulous. Set the sessions up, did all that. Uh, we did it at Mission Sound in New York. We had a, uh, a Grammy-winning engineer, uh, Mario McNulty, who'd done like a bunch of David Bowie's albums and mm. things like that. Uh, great, great, great engineer. Yeah. Uh, and between them, they, they, they make the song great. <laughs> so, yeah, it's got uh, and it's got some good uh, guests it was, it was on fantastic. the. Yeah, the, there's guests on the album too. Mickey Dolan's from the Monkees. Uh, Steve Hawley, who was yeah. a drummer in The Wings, and uh, and uh, and Elton John, and Jason Sheff from Chicago. So you put together a pretty good uh, group of musicians there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not the half of it. But, but yeah, we did. Uh, Jason Sheff from Chicago came in and sang. Uh, sang harmonies. He's a fantastic singer. Uh, so yeah, it was great when these guys came in. And, uh, Julian was lovely. Uh, Mark called him. And uh, he came over. I met Julian when the lot came out. All right, Julian I Lennon. Julian really Lennon. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Julian yeah. Lennon, yeah. yeah. And uh, he came in and uh, sang his harmonies and did his who's an ours for us. He was great. And a lovely guy. And thank you very much, Julian. You know, and uh, what's his name? It was the same Mickey Dolan. Yeah. He came in, sang the harmonies, 
Uh, and it's funny seeing these guys do what, you know, Mark tells them to do. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what you should do this. Don't just let them go there and do what they do, you know. Uh, makes the parts up. And, and uh, these guys come in, they learn the song. Uh, and Julian told me how he loved, he loved the song, so they were great. Uh, same with the other players. Everybody enjoyed uh, doing the record for that. They liked the song so much. Uh, it, was, it was just great, man. They we were professionals. And I look forward to working with them all again. Yeah. Great. So the album's called Be True to Yourself. Now, I mean, assuming concerts at some point come back, will you tour... And if you tour, where you call it uh, Joey Mullen's Bad Finger or Joey Mullen's Bad Finger, or what would what would you tour as? <laughs> uh, it'll be as if I tour on this record uh, and play these songs and play this stuff. I'll, I'll call it Joey Mullen. Okay. Uh, we, we might we might have a name for the band or not, but uh, yeah, I'm going to do it under my own name. In fact, the record's under my own name. Uh, People said to me I should call it the last bad thing or something like that, you know. Mm. But uh, I really don't want to do that. I've, I've never made a bad thing record uh, since the bad thing band broke up. Really, yeah. I've done I did the record of the songs in Nashville and when was it '94? I think. Okay. Uh, the one you the one you were talking about. Yeah. But I've never really recorded a, a new bad thing album. Yeah. You know. Uh, I, it doesn't, it's not a bad thing I can't, you know, no matter what I can't convince anybody that, that it's bad thing because it's not right. so that's the way I go out and do shows uh, where we feature all the bad thing in music or all the all the bad thing in songs I should say and um, I call that show Joey Mullins Bad Finger you know? that makes sense uh, yeah. I don't even I don't even I don't even call that Bad Finger you know sure. what I mean? Uh, I call it Joey Mullen's Bad Finger, and uh, that, that's the name I do those concerts on there. I also do uh, Joey Mullen shows. I do scary tour shows. Of them. You know, I have my own little band that I play with here, and I've got another band out in New Jersey called the Raz Band, hmm. uh, which is like a, a bit of a punky rock band. Uh, of course, we're, we're all a, a little bit elderly now, so it's not quite... <laughs> So fun, yeah. But, uh, but you know, I, I do I do things like that, and I pretty much do anything uh, to make some money <laughs> and to uh, yeah, and to enjoy myself. Really, I like to play music. I'm a musician. I like to play, and it, uh, uh, so there you go. There that's you very go. cool. Yeah. Is it? Did I hear that you have do you do you own an antique store in St. Paul, or do you just like antique stores? I heard something about antique stores. No, no, we've got we've got two antique stores. In, uh, in the Mall of St. Paul, uh, in a, in a, it's, which is like a big antique mall, you know? Okay. Uh, so we've got a couple of stalls in there. My girl and I, Mary, uh, run them together. And uh, it's great. We have, we have fun. And, and uh, we both uh, like antiques and, uh, you know, curios and things like that. Uh, um, I, I think we both, you know, the way you go through life and you see something, you pick it up. At a flea market or a yard sale or something, and uh, so yeah, we've hmm. got we've ended up with enough stuff where we decided to open a couple of stalls and, <laughs> and let things go. The houses are getting full. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you like? Do you like Saint Paul? Living in Saint Paul? Do you think that's better than um, living over uh, in England? Or what's what's the differences there? I, just... I prefer living in America, but, really? but I've got a career in America. I don't have the same kind of career in England. Really? Uh, hmm. Bad thing I had. Bad thing I had some success in England, but not much. Huh. Uh, and but our, our reputation and our success level was much higher in America. Interesting. Uh, I married an American, an American girl. Uh, yeah. And when the band, when the band broke up, uh, Kathy was my was my wife's name. Uh, we we moved over to America, moved to Los Angeles, lived there for a couple of years. Uh, that was a kind of hard time in our lives. Mm. Uh, destitute, didn't have any money. Uh, I wasn't playing in a band. Uh, I got a job. Uh, people gave us jobs. Uh, people let us live in their spare room. Uh, 
this was after the wow. bad thing, I and mean, we should have been lonely. Yeah. We didn't have any money or anything like that. Wow. And, uh, it, was, it, it was really a disaster at uh, the time. After a couple of years, uh, we kind of got over the, the, the stress of it all. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd been working as a carpenter. And, uh, uh, really? I got a, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, and uh, working as a carpet installer actually. Wow. Well. Jeez. Uh, Did anyone ever recognize you? Did anyone ever recognize you and say, yeah. "Hey, aren't you the guy from Badfinger? What are you doing?" Yeah, they did. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, you know, it's just you've got to work, man. <laughs> you've got to pay your bills. Yeah, you've got that's to feed true. your family. You know what I mean? Wow. It's like things you have to do. It doesn't matter who you are. You couldn't play in no. a cover band or something like that, or like play weddings or something. No, I didn't know anybody. I, didn't, <laughs> I, didn't, I really didn't know anybody, and I really oh, didn't wow. wanna. There wasn't any different ones where I don't suppose, but yeah. it's just you know in LA, you know in LA, like we didn't even have a car, man. So in, in LA. Um, it's hard enough to go to the grocery store. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like 10 miles away or something. Yeah. Uh, it was like a different world, huh. a really different world. Uh, so, no, I wasn't playing in a band. Uh, wow. I didn't really feel like playing in a band or all over the place. I did some sessions and some singing and things. Hmm. Uh, many, but I did a few of those. And then... Well, that's really about it. I still wrote songs, still made the demos and uh, stuff. And eventually, I got a phone call from the uh, people who wanted to make a record. Um, you know, it's, it's a long story. I don't know if you want to hear all that. But, sure. Uh, I did eventually make a, make a new record. And, well, actually, no, what am I talking about? In 1976, I, well, in 75, I went back to England for the funeral, Peter's funeral. Yeah. While I was there, I met an old friend of mine from Liverpool, uh, Mark Clark. He was hanging out there. He'd been playing bass in uh, John Heisman's Coliseum, which was kind of a big uh, alternative band in England, a uh, jazzy kind of flavor band, maybe fusion. And uh, he was going over to Jerry Shelley's house. And Jerry was the drummer in that room, Humble Pie. Mm. And they'd just broken up. So he said, do you want to come with me? I said, yes. So I went over with him to Jerry's house. And uh, we had a good little jam while we were there. And it went, it went so well, and we all got on so well, that we started to form a band. And we, we did have a band. It was called Natural Gas. Right. Didn't you tour and with uh, back Peter back Frampton? America. Yes, we did. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. We did that. And, yeah, that was it. Uh, I completely spaced that then. But yeah, yeah, I did that. Uh, 77, 78, uh, 77, that all fell apart. Mm. Uh, open personalities, you might say. And again, management contributed to that. But it all fell apart. Um, I went back out to LA, me and Kathy and I, well, actually, we still live in LA, and uh, we got, oh, what happened? Two guys came over uh, to my house one day. Uh, Joe Tancini and Kenny Ha, uh, a guitar player and a drummer, respectively. And they told me they wanted to make a band with me. They wanted to join a band. They loved my stuff and uh, they wanted to play in a band with me. So, did I want to come and uh, have a jam? So I said, yeah. And I went with them for a jam. And uh, Joe played me some songs he'd written. I thought they were really good. Uh, excellent, in fact. Mm. And, uh, we didn't have a bass player. So I called Tommy up to see what he was up to. And uh, he wasn't up to anything. <laughs> I was going to sneeze. I've got allergies. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> uh, but I called Tommy up, and Tommy said he'd come over. And he flew over from England and uh, played with us, the three of us. I mean, uh, so there were, there were now four of us. Yeah. And, we went, in the, we went in the studio and made some demos. We, we didn't really have a name or anything. Uh, uh, we were thinking of names. But anyway, we went in the studio and made some demos. Uh, Sound, Sound City in LA. And uh, 
We took them to a lawyer, and the lawyer said, oh, "That's great stuff." And we took it, took us down to Electra Asylum, and they thought it was great stuff too. They actually stopped the tape, two songs into the tape, and said, "What do you guys need? What do you want?" Uh, you know, it earns a money and all that to make a record. I mean, so, you know, our lawyer said, "Oh, they need this much," and they gave it to us. They gave it to us. <laughs> <laughs> wow! It's yeah, incredible. You- yeah, and then this is, this is 1976 with a lot of money. You know? Right, yeah. You made yeah. a couple more albums, yeah. and you, you ended up calling it Badfinger, right? We ended up calling the Electra Asylum record uh, Badfinger, and that led to us doing another Badfinger album. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it wasn't something, it doesn't matter, does it? Uh, yeah, we called it Badfinger and we did the record, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, yeah, you have a lot of. <laughs> yeah, you what? have. You have a lot of great songs. There's a new album, Be True to Yourself. Everyone should get that. Um, I always end with a charity or a nonprofit or a cause. Do you, is there a charity that you work with or a nonprofit or anything like that? I work with uh, many charities. Uh, I do uh, charitable events. I don't really, really talk about it much. Uh, just when they come up and do, do with it, you know, when I, I contribute to charities and things uh, when I've got the money. Uh, but no, no, the, 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 the title of the album uh, has nothing to do with that. Or, or, you know, really, I just, I just do those things like you would. It, you know, anybody would if they had the chance, the opportunity. So uh, that's what I do. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much yeah. for uh, coming on my show. I really appreciate it. I uh, hope that if I, if you ever get to Phoenix, I'll come and uh, see you. I'll try to bring as many people as I can to come uh, see you perform. That'd be really cool. Oh, please do. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, hope the people out there like my songs. Or, you know, the, uh, they've got three singles that they can listen to. Yeah, I listen uh, to them. Right They're now, great. The album. They're great tunes. They yeah, sound like uh, uh, old Beatles, Badfinger kind of 70s, that melodic power pop uh, stuff. It's great. Do you, do you play them on your, on your show at all, or do you play music on the show? Uh, no, I don't play music. I'm always scared because I feel like there's some record company is going to come after me and say that I, I played the song. I don't know. But people can listen on Spotify. That's what I did. Oh, they, yeah, yeah there, are, there are links and everything. The record company will send you a link. Yeah, okay. Uh, music. And, uh, you know, on the phone recordings, uh, they'll just, just get in touch with them. They'll send you a link to the uh, songs and a uh, biography and uh, some photos and all the rest of it. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know okay. most record companies that are putting out records will do that for themselves. Okay. Yeah? Sounds uh, good. Well, thank you. So- yeah. Thank you so much, Joey. Well, thank you. And I hope you get, you know, enough to use on your podcast. Absolutely. And, uh, good luck to you, man. Okay, you too. Thanks. Good luck to you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So Joey Mullen's new album, Be True to Yourself, you can hear the songs. Uh, they're out on Spotify, Apple Music, uh, iTunes, Amazon Music now, and uh, hopefully he'll be touring soon. I'd, I'd love to hear the new songs as well as the old Badfinger stuff, of course. Uh, make sure you follow him. I think he's on Facebook under the name. Uh, the page is called Original Badfinger. Uh, I'm on all social media as well if you'd like to follow me and keep up to date with new episodes. Uh, you can also sub- subscribe to the show on iTunes, uh, follow on Spotify, or subscribe on uh, YouTube. And if you want to help me out, you can write me a nice review on iTunes, or you can always just send cash to my Venmo to help support the show. I'll, I'll take cash. Uh, thank you so much to Joey for coming on. Thank you for listening, and remember to shoot for the moon. <laughs>